Oh. Well, we're going to pick up where we left off last week. And I cast out a sheet to you last week. Um, on grace, okay. Mm -hmm. Take that out. We, we just about finished this. I'm not sure if we did, but um, one thing I want to point out, you know, we, we went over um, Sanctifying grace. What is sanctifying grace? Michelle, without looking, what is sanctifying grace? Remember, it's our share in whose life? The divine life. The divine life. That's what sanctifying grace is. We share in God's own life. We weren't conceived and born with it. When did we get it, Kristen? We were baptized. We were baptized. Original sins washed away. We get God's life put in our souls. Okay? And um, it is also called habitual grace. Okay? You can write that in there where it says, sanctifying grace, a share in participation in God's own life, grace that sanctifies us, makes us God's children, write in there, habitual grace. Okay? Habitual. That's what it's called too, it's called habitual grace. And what that means, it is always in us once we're baptized, okay, unless we do something, unless we commit a sin that is serious, a mortal sin, then we lose it. But sanctifying grace is called habitual grace because it's, it's in us all the time. And we can grow in it, deepen it in our, our, our share in God's life by good acts, by by doing good, by holiness. Okay. And um, as I said, there it's, it's our key to attaining heaven. We lose it through a mortal sin. What is a mortal sin? Three conditions for a mortal sin. It's got to be serious. We have to know it's serious. In other words, it involves our intellect. And we full consent of the will. We freely chose to do it, even though we knew it was seriously wrong. That's the conditions for a mortal sin. If all three are met, we have a mortal sin. And once we lose it, mortal sin uh, loses sanctifying grace for us. We're out of a state of grace. How do we get it back? It's not too difficult. God is very merciful. How do we get it back? Claire? Through confession, that's all you have to do. You go to confession, you get back in a state of grace. The priest absolves you from your sins, and you're restored to a state of grace. And that's why the sacrament of, of penance, or confession, reconciliation it's called, it's called also the sacrament of second baptism. Because it's almost like getting baptized again. In other words, you're getting restored to God's life. It's a second baptism, third baptism, 50th baptism, 100th baptism. As long as someone is really sorry, if they commit mortal sins, they can be forgiven. God will always forgive. Always. Unless there's a hardness of heart and a refusal to ask for forgiveness. That's the only obstacle for getting forgiven. So, um, now the bottom section there, actual grace. Actual graces are temporary, periodic helps that God gives us to strengthen our intellect and our will to do good or to avoid evil. There's a basic rule that I'm going to write up here of grace. Okay? Basic rule. Basic rule of grace. And it's this. Any, any good we do is because God's grace okay, 
God's grace moves us okay, to do it. Okay? Here we're talking about uh, God's grace, uh, actual graces. Okay? The periodic helps that we get from God. Okay? Whenever we're doing good, it's God's grace that's moving us to do good. But, okay, the contrary to this is, any evil we do, okay, sin, okay, is due to our refusal to cooperate with God's grace. Cooperate with God's grace. In other words, it's our fault, okay? Our fault. Now we're reminded of this truth at every Mass if we say the Confidior. Now I don't know about your parishes where you attend Mass. Uh, at, at my parishes, I like to say the Confidior all the time. Confidior is, I confess to Almighty God, to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned. What do we say now? We strike our breast three times through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. It's my fault if I sin, in other words, okay? All sin is due to us, refusing to cooperate with God's grace. There's no temptation that is too great for our free will to overcome. The devil and all his, his powers of hell cannot force us to commit the smallest sin. So any evil sin we do is due to our refusal to cooperate with God's grace. God's grace is always there, in other words, to help us resist temptation. See, so God always gives grace to resist temptation. That's another complementary to this. God always gives grace to resist temptation. Always. God's grace is, is, uh, is always given to us. But we can refuse to cooperate with it. That's why any evil or sin we commit, it's our fault. Because we're refusing to cooperate with God's grace. And uh, I have a, a couple of other handouts here, okay? Um, let's Take a look at the front of this. If you hold it long ways um, vertically, okay. um, this is a little sheet on the Holy Spirit and grace. And grace, if you read down under where it says grace, the merits of Christ are applied to us by the sanctifier, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. So if you look uh, on the left, the mission of the Holy Spirit that was sent by the Father and the Son is to sanctify. The Holy Spirit is meant to sanctify us. The Holy Spirit is called the sanctifier. If you look to the right of what I just read there, um, this is a little diagram of the Trinity. Okay? The Father and the Son they love each other, the love unites them, and their love is so perfect that their love from all eternity 
has produced the Trinity, Trinity, pardon me, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the person of love in the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is the fruit of the love between the Father and the Son for all of Trinity. Anyway, we go down to two sides of, of the, the page there, top. Sanctifying grace, a supernatural gift won for us by Christ's passion and death, freely given by the Holy Spirit, makes the soul holy and pleasing to God. It makes us holy, it makes us God's friends. Okay? Temples of the Holy Spirit and deserving of heaven. We need sanctifying grace to get to heaven. And then actual grace, actual grace helps us to know the intellect, evil and good, and it helps to strengthen our will to do the good and to avoid evil. Actual grace is momentary aids, day-to-day -day helps from God to avoid sin and practice virtue. Now, just hold on to that because I have another sheet to hand out to you today. On um, the effects of sin. <clears throat> if you hold this vertically as well, okay. The effects of sin. This has two sides to it. Look on the old side, it says the effects of sin. Mortal sin takes away sanctifying grace, sharing God's own divine life, which gives us God's friendship and the right to heaven, thus placing us in a state of sin as opposed to a state of grace. It takes away our merit for our good actions, too. You know, if someone's in a state of mortal sin, nothing they do that's good has credit in God's eyes. So God, it's like a lifeline cut off from God. We're cut off from God, so God doesn't recognize any good we do. Some people say, well, you know, I, I don't go to church or follow the, you know, a lot of the commandments, but I, you know, I, I give a lot of money to, uh, to my favorite charity or something. Well, that means nothing in God's eyes unless the person's in a state of grace because Mortal sin separates us from God. So any good that we do is not recognized by God. God takes no account of it if we're out of a state of grace. And mortal sin demands punishment. Two kinds of punishment. Temporal punishment, which is either on earth or in purgatory, and eternal punishment, hell. If someone commits a mortal sin, one of the punishments that they deserve is, is hell to suffer to be separated from God for eternity. Um, temporal punishment means that in addition to that eternal punishment, there's a punishment either on earth or in purgatory that one will have to undergo. When we go to confession and the priest absolves you, say, from a mortal sin, the eternal punishment is taken away. It's remitted. So there's no longer the eternal punishment due, but there's a temporal punishment that remains. And that is why the priest gives a penance when we go to the sacrament of penance. And think about, I think I used this image before, the nails of Jesus' cross as being our sins. When the sin is forgiven, the nail is taken out, the sin is thrown away. But what remains in the wood after the nail is taken? Hole. Hole. That's the effect of our sins. So we have to fill up the holes by doing good to make up for the harm we've done. That's a matter of God's justice. If we don't make up for all the harm we've done through our sins in this life, we'll do so in purgatory. That's what, that's what purgatory is for. It's a place of purgation for the soul to purify it of all attachment to sin, all the effects of sin. We have to be completely pure before we see God. And I'll just say this, okay? I, when I preach on this, I tell people this. I'm looking forward to purgatory. I know I'm not a saint. I haven't lived a life of heroic virtue. And so I'm fully expecting to go to purgatory. In my will, I have that 
that masses will be offered for me, for my soul, to apply the, the fruits of that mass to my soul to help me get out of purgatory. That's why we pray for the souls of purgatory. That's why we have a funeral mass for someone. The fruits of that mass are applied to that soul, to help that soul get to heaven if they're not there yet. We never know. We can't canonize people. The church does that formally. Who's going to be canonized in about five days, I think it is? What's, what's today? No, it's about two weeks. Today's what, the 14th? I think it's about two weeks from today. You know who's going to be canonized? Well, two saints are going to be canonized. Of course, they're not saints yet. But two popes are going to be canonized. You know who those are? If you hit one just died about a dozen years ago, yes. John Paul. John Paul II and John the Twenty Third, who was the Pope in the early 1960s, 1959 to about 1963. They're both going to be canonized saints. When when the church canonizes someone, we we were we're almost assured that they're in heaven. So we no longer pray for their soul, we pray to them, actually through them, asking their help. That's called the communion of the saints. You can ask you know, the saints in heaven to pray for us. And, uh, but that's only after someone's canonized. If, if, if my, my grandmother died, I think she's in heaven, my grandmother. You know, I still pray for her, but I think she's, she's in heaven. Uh, but I don't know that, so I can't pray to my grandmother saying, pray for me. I pray for her. Yes. Um, what did Pope John do that was like uh, got him to be a saint? Well, to, to be a saint, you have to live a life of heroic virtue, meaning your own personal life. It's not necessarily you have to do something great that the world sees. You can be a holy soul and no one knows about it. You can live a life of a monk out, out in some cave and live an extremely holy life. No one's going to see that but God. But usually you need some witnesses to give a testimony that this person lived a holy life and you need miracles too. That's one of the ways the church uh, assures that someone's a saint. They say if, if people are praying for saint's intercession, for a miracle, and that miracle takes place, that's a sign that that person's in heaven. And so Pope John Paul II and Pope John the Twenty-Third, they had miracles worked through their intercession. However, usually it requires two miracles, but our Pope, our Pope Francis, did away with the second requirement for a miracle for these two popes. He said, I'm going to canonize them because I believe they're, they're, they're saints. The Pope can do this. He's the head of the church. He's the head lawmaker. So he, he circumvented the usual route and declared them, he's declaring them saints without the second miracle. They, all, they both had a miracle to be beatified. Yes. What miracle did Pope John Paul II do? Uh, if you Google it, some some woman was cured or something. I forget. Usually it's a physical healing. I was just watching with Father Reese last night. Has anyone ever seen the song of Bernadette? No. Gosh, you might go get go on. You can Google it probably and get it. It won the Academy Award for Best Picture in 1954. Jennifer Jones played Saint Bernadette, who to whom the Blessed Virgin Mary appeared at Lourdes in France. And uh, the Blessed Virgin appeared a number of times, and the last time she appeared, people, many people were believing in Bernadette, but others scoffed. And the Blessed Mother said, dig and wash your face from the stream. She dug in the dirt. There was some, like a, some mud she found underneath. She started washing her face, and people laughed at her. And then she walked away, and all the crowds left except a couple of guys. And when they saw the stream of water come flowing out, one of the guys washed with it, and he, he was blind in one eye, and he was able to see. And uh, there have been many miracles performed at Lourdes since then. So um, miracles are, are one way that God kind of acknowledges someone is a saint in heaven. Someone prays to someone and says, please work a miracle on my behalf. So John the 23rd of John Paul II had a miracle for being beatified. That's the step before canonization. Canonization means your holiness is recognized throughout the whole church, and you can pray to that person, asking their help. But we don't 
start praying for our friends or relatives, we are praying to them. We rather pray for them, offer masses for them. Because we don't know if they're in heaven. If they are, our prayers aren't wasted. God will apply the prayers or the masses to someone else who needs it in purgatory. And um, anyway, a venial sin is a sin that, that lessens our love of God. It lessens our resistance to mortal sin, and it demands temporal punishment, either on earth or in purgatory. Not eternal punishment. A venial sin, because it's not, usually we're talking about sins that aren't serious, they weaken our souls, they, they make us more prone to commit mortal sin, but they don't take away God's life, and they don't deserve eternal punishment. So, um, and just on the side, yes? I'm just kind of from this, but was Pope John Paul or Pope John's body um, incorruptible? I don't know if his body is incorrupt or not. I think it might be. John the 23rd, I think, is. That's another sign of possible uh, you know, sanctity, if the body did not corrupt. I've seen many bodies of saints that have not corrupted you. Their skin has turned dark, but their skin is still on. And usually they'll have a, a wax, um, uh, some wax placed over their face to conform to their face, so you're not seeing this dark skin. I have uh, pictures of, of a number of saints that uh, um, their bodies are incorrupt. And I've even visited some tombs of, of the saints where their bodies are incorrupt. There's, there's no corruption of the skin. There's no decay of the skin, which can be a sign of, of holiness. It's not a sure sign. You need miracles in addition and testimonies. But it, it is a contributing factor, you could say. So. See. If you look at, um, turn this to the side of that same sheet, divine justice, you just to understand uh, how what I've been talking about works, okay? Punishment for sin it is eternal, okay? Uh, that means it's everlasting. It's due to unforgiven mortal sin. Unrepentant, I like to say. If someone persists in mortal sin and they never repent, they die unrepentant, then they're separated from God for eternity. They're, they're in a state of eternal separation because why? At the point of death, there's no more choosing after death. You're not given a choice after you die because everyone would choose heaven. The, the, the will, choosing good or evil, is something that we only do in this life. So that's why it's important to um, be in a state of grace, because we don't know, you know the day nor the hour where we could, we could die. And uh, so I mean, I could, I could walk out today and be driving down the street and get hit by a truck and be killed. I want to be in a state of grace. So, So, unrepentant mortal sin is suffered in hell. However, the eternal punishment that is due to a mortal sin is removed by, you see what it says there? Perfect contrition, okay? Even before someone goes to, well, or confession and either imperfect or perfect contrition. If someone goes to confession and gets absolved, okay, then the eternal punishment is removed that is deserving of a mortal sin. However, if someone has perfect contrition, that is, um, if you read the small print underneath, contrition is perfect when it arises from perfect love, that is, when we hate sin more than all evil because it offends God, the supreme good. So if we have perfect contrition, that can take away a mortal sin, but we still have to confess it at the, at the nearest opportunity. But if someone is, say, dying, and they don't have a priest around, if they can express perfect contrition, then that eternal punishment can be remitted. They'll be restored to a state of grace, even without the sacrament of penance. God will allow that if someone has perfect contrition. And when someone goes to confession, we should try to have perfect contrition. But imperfect contrition is suffices. Imperfect contrition is uh, the next little 
section there in the small print, contrition is imperfect when it arises from imperfect love. When we hate sin because by it we lose heaven, deserve hell, or because sin is so hateful in itself. Now, what this means is if someone is only uh, afraid of going to hell and losing heaven, that's imperfect contrition. If someone is really sorry because their sins have offended God, that's perfect contrition. We should try to have perfect contrition all the time. And if someone really has perfect contrition, that will, that will take them out of a state of mortal sin. But we never know if it's perfect contrition on ourselves. We may, we may have selfish motives, okay? If a plane is going down, I always use this example, if the pilot says, okay, the engines just went out, we have about 30 seconds before we crash. And someone has been, knows they're in a state of mortal sin. Well, if they can make an act of perfect contrition, uh, then their soul will be saved. If they can't, if they're all they're doing is saying, well, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to go to hell for all I've done, and they crash, they're separated from God for eternity. However, if the person makes an act of perfect contrition and the plane pulls out and doesn't crash, the engines come back on, that person has to go to confession to get that, those mortal sins forgiven. Because that's what Jesus established. When he rose from the dead, who sins you forgive are forgiven them. And he gave his apostles power to forgive sins. Now that's eternal punishment. Now, all sin, mortal and venial, carries with it temporal punishment. See temporal punishment here? Okay. Turn, turn your sheet to the side. Uh, okay. So you can read with me. Please sit up straight if you would, okay? And temporal punishment lasts only for a time. That's what temporal means. It's only, it's only temporary for, for a time. It's due to forgiven sin, mortal or venial, and unforgiven venial sins. Now, one of the benefits of going to confession frequently, like every month, or even more frequently than that, is that we're always recalling our sins and, and confessing them. We commit a lot of venial sins, you know, impatience, anger, that we may forget about, and not even confess or, or, or express contrition for. Well, if we don't make up for those in this life, we're going to do it in purgatory. So it's better to do it in this life, believe me, You've seen the testimonies of people in purgatory, they suffer horribly. Um, it's a purification. Purgatory is a suffering by fire, by the way. That's what our catechism teaches, yes? Um, for uh, confession, like how detailed are you supposed to be? Well, you have to confess any mortal sins, kind in number. The kind of sin it was, the approximate number of times it was committed. If it's so frequently. If someone comes to me and says, I miss Mass for 20 years, I don't make them get out a calculator and say, okay, how many Sundays and Holy Days did you miss? I, I get an idea. That's, that's a general idea. That's what you need. But usually it's, you know, I did something serious, you know, one time or two times, and you have to be specific in the sin. If someone comes to me and says, Father, I had, I had sex with, with, with a woman, I'll say, okay, well, I have to determine what type of sin this is. If this is just fornication, two unmarried people, or if it's adultery, or if it's double adultery. Meaning, were you married? Are you married, or is that other person you had relations with married? If you're both married, then it's, it's more serious because then it's adultery twice over. If, if it's two married people and they're both being unfaithful to their spouses. So you have, to, you have to say what type of a sin it is, and then how many times you committed it. If someone has been in an affair, I'll say, well, how many times have you had relations with this person? Um, so, and the temporal punishment okay, is expiated, is taken away on earth by all these things, by penance, by prayer, by almsgiving, by good works, by patient suffering, by indulgences. So we can take away the punishment due to our sins by uh, doing the penance that the priest gives us, for example, by prayers, by almsgiving, giving, giving, sharing our goods with the poor, by other good works, by bearing, suffering patiently. You know, how many of us have to exercise patience when things bother us? If you never lose your patience, tell me how you do it, because I want to know. We all lose our patience. We all get angry when things don't go right. But patiently bearing suffering can 
can take away the punishment due to our sins. And indulgences, and indulgences, the remission of a punishment for sin, either partial or all of it, based upon the church's um, grant. There, there are certain prayers that are indulgence prayers or a partial indulgence. If you say Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, that's a partial indulgence. And uh, it takes away punishment for sin. Well, this is expiated on earth by these means, okay? Punishment, temporal punishment, or in purgatory. Purgatory is only temporary. Purgatory is going to end. You know when purgatory ends? Purgatory is over on the last day when Jesus comes again. Purgatory ends. There's no more purgatory. No souls will go to heaven. If you make it to purgatory, you're just you're at the doorstep to heaven. You're just getting cleaned up your soul before you get there. That's where it is. And most of us will need it. That's the common teaching of the church. That's why I said, I plan on purgatory. We should strive to be saints. I'll, I'll still strive, but I'm a realist, and I know I'm not a, I haven't lived a life of heroic virtue, and I know I get impatient, and I, I, I suffer my own sins. So if, if, if I get to heaven without any purgatory, I'll be surprised, okay? Because I'm asking people to pray for me after death. And that's what we should do, pray for our loved ones offer things up to them. And punishment is imposed by God to satisfy his justice, the scales of justice. God will forgive sins, but uh, still we have to make up for, for this harm we've done. And that's his justice. This teaches the evil of sin that warns against our committing sin. Now, turn the page over because uh, this is another little thing that's important. Have any of you ever heard of something okay, called the four last things? Andrew, can you turn that over? Turn over your sheet, okay? See up on top there? The four last things. Has anyone ever heard of that? It's, it's a classic uh, way of describing the fact that in the end, there are only four last things. And they are, as it says up there on top, death, judgment, heaven, and hell. What will happen at the moment we die, the very moment we die? What's going to happen to us? And don't say we're going to go to heaven because there's something that happens before we go anywhere. What's going to happen at the exact moment of our death? The moment we die, we're going to stand before God, and what's going to happen? Can you, know, can you take a guess? He's going to judge us. That's it. It's the judgment. We're going to be judged. Death. Death comes to us all. We're all going to die. That's for sure. That's a certainty. Unless we're alive when Jesus comes again at the end of the world. That's the only exception. But other than that, all of us are going to, to die. And... Uh, Here you have help with you, John? Yeah. Okay, good. Turn over your sheet there to the back. That's it. Okay. So, um, death is a certainty. We're, we're all going to die. And um, believe me, as one grows older, like me, okay, death becomes more of something as a reality that one thinks about. I have friends that have died. And when you see friends start dying, you think, oh, gee, maybe this could happen to me. Anyway, we're all going to die at the moment of death is judgment. And that judgment is called the particular judgment at the moment we die. You may want to write that in. Particular, also individual. Okay? Write that next to it where it says judgment. Okay, Judgment, particular or individual judgment. That's what we're talking about. Judgment is, that's what's going to happen at the moment of death. In particular, it means individual, okay? So, particular individual, it means each one of us is going to be judged at the moment we die. And 
in the end, there, there's either heaven or hell. Because purgatory is going to come to an end. Purgatory is just getting cleaned up for heaven. So in the end, it's either there's going to be death judgment in either heaven or hell. And heaven or hell will depend upon whether we die in a state of grace or not. The most important time of our life is the moment of our death. If we die in a state of grace, we're going to get to heaven. We may have to get, have to get cleaned up in purgatory for some, some period, but we're going to get to heaven. So the particular judgment there, you see that, okay, immediately after death results in heaven for souls free from all sin and all punishment. And happiness of heaven consists in the beatific vision, seeing, loving, enjoying God for all eternity. And um, purgatory for souls free from all mortal sin, but not venial sin and or punishment from either mortal and venial sins. If punishment is still due for our sins, then it's purgatory. Hell for souls in mortal sin. If someone dies in unrepentant mortal sin, and that's really uh, unrepentant. That's the key. You're not repenting. So unrepentant mortal sin, you die in unrepentant mortal sin, it's, it's, it's uh, separation from God for eternity. And that's a particular judgment. But then there's a general judgment. That's at the end of the world. When, uh, when Jesus comes again to judge the living and the dead, where it says under here, all after reunion of all souls with their bodies, that's the resurrection from the dead, everyone is going to get a body back on the last day. And whether you get a body that's glorified for heaven or a body that's going to suffer in hell will depend upon whether you die in a state of grace or not out of mortal sin or in mortal sin. And the general judgment um, results in the reward of heaven. Come, blessed of my Father, possess the kingdom of the prayer for the kingdom of the world, um, or the punishment of hell, depart from thee into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, if there's an individual judgment, if each of us is going to be judged at the moment we die, why is there a general judgment? Why is everyone going to stand before God at the same time and be judged in a general manner? That's what's going to happen. And do you know where that happens? It's, it's, the tradition is the Valley of Jehoshaphat, the valley between the Mount of Olives and the city of Jerusalem. That valley, all the people of the world, the valley will be widened. All the people of the world, whoever lived, are going to be gathered there for the general judgment when Christ comes again to judge the living and the dead. Everyone's going to be in a body, either a glorified body or a body to suffer with. Why is there a general judgment if there's a particular judgment, an individual one? Do you know why? Have you ever studied this? Why? Uh, this is just a guess, but because at the individual judgment, we don't have our bodies. Well, so. that's true. We're just judging our soul, but that's not the real reason for the general judgment. The general judgment is for God's justice so that everyone will see what everyone else has done for good or ill and everyone will see the, the effects of everyone's actions either good or ill. In other words, um, we're going to see what everyone has done. Some people, you know, the rich and the famous, you know, they get on entertainment tonight or something and, you know, they gave money to save the whales or something, but they may lead very immoral, evil lives, personally. Well, God isn't going to be fooled. We're going to see who is really good, who is really bad. Everyone's going to see the good actions and the effects of good, and the evil actions and the effects of evil. That's why my favorite movie of all time is It's a Wonderful Life. Anyone ever seen it? Have you seen It's a Wonderful Life? Um, what happens to George Bailey? George Bailey, his uncle, his uncle loses the deposit from at the bank, and he thinks he's going to be arrested. And so he thinks about killing himself, jumping off the bridge. And his guardian angel, Clarence, who's trying to earn his wings, he comes to stop George Bailey. He does it by jumping in the river himself, and George pulls him out. And then the angel says, well, you know, 
I came to save you because you were going to throw yourself in the river. He says, things aren't so bad. And George says to him, uh, well, I wish I'd never been born. I'm just, you know, I'm a failure. Everyone would be better off if I'd never been born. And so what does Clarence, his guardian angel, do? Do you remember what he does? What does he do? Um, he like takes him back through his life and shows him different moments that were different. Shows him what things would have been like in Bedford Falls if he had never lived. So people are mean. There are um, it's, it's a very mean spirited town, and um, people aren't friendly. There's there's just a a bad aura over the whole town. The point of Clarence showing George Bailey, Clarence the guardian angel, showing George Bailey what Bedford Falls would have been like had he never lived is to show all the good he did. He didn't realize all the good he'd done. That's what makes it a beautiful story. So that's why we have the general judgment, because everyone's going to see who is really good, who is really bad. The effects of all our actions, either good or evil. If someone writes, produces a movie that's evil, that affects a lot of people, causes people to sin even for generations, okay? this, this will be known by everyone. And you know, the good that we do, or the evil that, that the evildoers do, in heaven or hell, this will be rewarded or punished accordingly. You know, there are levels of punishment and levels of glory in heaven and hell. We merit heaven. We gain more glory and happiness in heaven the more good we do here on earth. God rewards us. We will have a greater share in the vision of God, of eternal happiness, if the holier we are on this earth. The more evil someone is, the more they will suffer. If someone has brought a lot of souls to hell, they will suffer more. That's God's justice. There are degrees of glory and degrees of punishment in heaven and hell. And with glory, with happiness, that's what we call merit. We merit our, our <coughs> we merit grace. We grow in holiness here on earth, and God will reward us for our holiness once we get to heaven. If we really lived holy lives. So knowing that, who has the highest place in heaven after not talking about Jesus, he's God, who would have the next highest place in heaven after Jesus? Because that person is the next most holy person next to Jesus. Who do you think that is? Who? The uh, saints. Well, one in particular. I'm saying who? There's Mary. one person. The Blessed Virgin Mary, filled with grace. After her, the church's common opinion is that St. Joseph. St. Joseph was the next holiest person. Because he needed, God gives more grace to the person who, who needs it for their vocation. Joseph was the foster father of Jesus, the husband of Mary. We can go down the saints then. Some were perform more heroic virtues than others. And uh, that's why we should be striving to be saints in this life, to get the highest place in heaven. St. Teresa of Avila said, she's a doctor of the church, by the way. St. Teresa said she would be willing to undergo all the punishments and sufferings the world has to offer from until the end of the world in order to gain a slightly higher place in heaven. Why is that? Because heaven is eternal. It never ends. So the happiness we attain in this life will be in direct proportion to the happiness we will have in heaven for eternity. So we should be willing to bear our crosses, our sufferings, be patient, be kind, uh, lead a life of heroic virtue, because we'll have greater happiness in heaven. That's God's promise. He rewards us for our good. That's what we call merit. And um, Kylie Kaiser and Emily Bauerschmidt, please come to the main office at the bell. Kylie Kaiser, Emily Bauerschmidt, come to the main office at the bell. We'll, we'll end there today.